Okay. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Monero Research Lab office hour with me, your host, Justin, and the person you actually want to see, Dr. Srang Nother. So to start, I would like to have Dr. Srang Nother introduce himself. But before we get started, I think it would be useful to set expectations for what this session is. It's very casual on purpose. We are here such that we can answer your questions. Mostly it'd be Mr. Srang Nother answering your questions. And uh, yeah, so I will be paying attention to YouTube. I'll be paying attention to Discord just to relay questions over. But uh, otherwise, this is really your time to make of it what you would like. So uh, yeah, we're here to answer anything you have. So how about, uh, Sarang, can you introduce yourself, please? Uh, sure. So I am uh, Dr. Sarang Nother. I'm a cryptographer and mathematician uh, who is a um, research contributor to the Monero Research Lab. The Monero Research Lab is a research and development work group. Not the only one, but it's a research and development work group um, that uh, conducts you know, research and development uh, for the Monero project. Um, so that ends up being stuff involving protocol research, um, some of the math, prototyping, coding, all sorts of things um, to kind of push the Monero protocol and privacy preserving digital assets uh, forward in general from a technical perspective. Um, and like Justin said, uh, the purpose of this office hour just to give an opportunity to just kind of very informally um, give a uh, video forum in this case um, in order to, you know, answer any questions that come up, uh, topics that people want to know more about. So this could be Justin and I sitting here in the quiet for an hour, like often happens in kind of standard university in-person office hours, you know, or it can be, you know, really whatever sort of technical aspects that folks want to talk about. So I guess I'm using whatever, you know, media you, uh, I guess have access to Justin. You said you're watching uh, the Discord and YouTube. Is that right? Well, cool. um, yeah. So for any questions that people have, um, you know, go ahead and shoot them off to us there. We can talk about it. Otherwise, I'll sit here with my little cup. Perfect. I, I brought my coffee. You know, I, I haven't had a lot of coffee with my actual coffee chats recently, but uh, I feel like doubled down on the coffee the last few days. Were you yeah. the type of person in, in, in high school? Well, maybe high school, depending, but in college that went to office hours, were you the type of person that would usually go, or is this something you did, go, you did not go to that often? I did go to office hours, you know, when I had questions, and um, later as a TA, and even later as an instructor, um, I don't know, and then, and then I had a new appreciation for the nature of office hours when I was the one, you know, running the office hours, but I did discover that oftentimes um, it was like this really cool combination of you know, folks who came because they really wanted to understand something that they didn't, you know, prior to that. But there were also a lot of students who really did know what they were doing. And they were just really interested in making sure that they, you know, kind of had as much face-to-face -face time to kind of go over new problems as they could. So one thing I like is that it was like, oh, this is not some kind of sign of weakness to go to office hours. You know, it's like a sign of, um, I guess, being motivated and dedicated to what you're learning. But... There were still many times when I had no one show up to office hours. And then it was just me reading books for an hour. What are you going to do? Yeah, I guess. Do you have any questions or any topics of any kind? At the moment, there are no questions and no topics of any kind. But uh, of course, it's well, open. I mean, we can also just talk a little bit of those, I guess. So, you know, some yeah, I was, I was thinking one way we could do is sort of troll the answers out of people. We can just start saying, like, well, what do you think about this obnoxious thing just to get people all riled up about it? But uh, before we do that, how about you tell us to talk about what you've been doing with the Monero Research Lab the last month or so? So I would say probably like the most interesting thing that people might care about, or you know, hopefully at least they'll care about the effects of it, um, is gonna be CLSAG, which is, um, it's a, a new link linkable, <laughs> a linkable ring signature. Nope, a linkable ring signature construction um, that was really intended to kind of be a drop-in replacement to the linkable ring construction that the Monero protocol used to use is called MLSAG. I will say that in hindsight, I really regret us not giving it a cooler name. But you know what? What would have been a cooler name for that? I have no idea. If anyone has any ideas, you should tell us. I mean, we ended up getting a pretty cool CLSAG logo. Basically, you know, the community came together and we had a few ideas that were pitched, one of which we ultimately went with in the blog post and they're credited at the bottom. But, uh, you know, it's it's not quite as 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 easy to market as something like Halo or yeah, Arcturus. You know, because you know originally the um, the so prior to like the confidential transaction model, the linkable ring signature scheme um, was one 
uh, by some other authors. It was called LSAG, Linkable Spontaneous Anonymous Group Signatures. And then from that point on, you know, moving into the uh, confidential transaction model where we replaced, you know, kind of in the clear amounts, commitments to amounts. And then we moved to one that was developed um, by Shen Noether and others, um, kind of more of an in-house kind of thing. Um, and that was called MLSAG, it's a multi-layered, linkable, spontaneous, anonymous group signatures. And the idea there is that you had both information in the signature um, that dealt with both like signing keys, but also certain commitment keys. And by kind of cleverly setting up and arranging how, how you do that signature, um, you could both, um, you know, show this kind of signer ambiguous you know, signature model that you're looking for, but also throw in um, a, a, a proof of balance, which is very important, um, but also completely in a signer ambiguous way. Um, the downside to the MLSEG signatures, of course, is you basically kind of have two sets of data floating around um, in the signature itself. You have some sets of data that deals with like the signing keys and a kind of a separate set of parallel data that deals with um, the commitment keys. So the scaling on that, you know, is not very good. It scales as, you know, the anonymity set per transaction goes up, it scales that way. But at the same time, every time you're adding on, you know, new ring members, you're actually adding on two pieces of data effectively, one for signing keys and one for commitment keys. And so the uh, kind of the new hotness now, CLSEG, which is concise, linkable, spontaneous anonymous group signatures. So it is what it is. There was a name that was chosen and thought about changing it, but then we're like, ah, uh, you know, we've already named it. Can't really rename it. So people already knew it by that. We didn't want to make everything more confusing. So, uh, but the idea there is to kind of take this information involving these, um, this data for signing keys and this data for commitment keys. And it turns out you can combine them together in this weighted fashion that you know involves some hash functions to ensure that you know someone can't kind of maliciously go through and, and run a forgery on the signature um, and basically do the same thing that uh, MLSAG signatures do both show in a signer ambiguous way that you're signing a message on behalf of an, one of the unknown keys I guess one of the set keys but you don't know which one it is um, but also basically signing with this other commitment key that you need to prove balance so it's more or less a drop in replacement, but now effectively you only have to have one set of, of data involved. So one piece of information per ring member and then some additional uh, auxiliary information that's used just to make the algebra work. So the benefits to this are that it's basically a drop in replacement. So that's great. You know, everything involving key images sticks around, everything involving the way that these keys are structured gets to stick around. Um, but the benefits, this benefits that you get for it are that first, the signatures are much smaller. So um, effectively, the signatures that you get for CLSAG are about half the size as for MLSAG. That's just the signature alone. Transactions include more than just um, just the signature. So the fact that they're uh, smaller in that sense, but they're also faster to verify because it turns out you can do some optimization with the way that these operations take place. Because before you had to do some um, cryptographic operations on like the linkable side of the data and on the commitment side of the data. And now you can effectively do them at the same time and you can optimize that away a little bit. So benefits there are that you end up with about 20% faster signature verification. So transactions that spend multiple inputs, which most transactions spend between one and two inputs and generate some other outputs. Um, but for every one of those spent inputs, you need um, a separate signature. And so it turns out that for the most common forms of transactions, like a two input, two output transaction, for example, um, you end up seeing overall about a 25% decrease in the transaction size, and overall probably about a 10% um, speed up in the overall transaction verification. So that's pretty good. You know, there's really no downsides to this. Um, of course, we want to make sure that the security model for this was very strong. So the security model, it basically just says, you know, um, what properties do we want this construction to have? And for our particular purposes, we want there to be these properties involving you know, forgeability and non-slanderability and linkability. And, and there's kind of this, this list of them that you want this linkable ring signature construction to have. So what you do is you basically build this kind of hypothetical model of an imaginary attacker. And you kind of you know, give this attacker different powers to do things. So um, you, know, you might give this imaginary attacker like the power to convince honest users to hand over their private keys. Or you might give this imaginary attacker the power to persuade honest users to, you know, build arbitrary transactions on the attacker's behalf. And then you show that, you know, even if the attacker had these powers, it still can't go and like generally break these properties that we want it to have without also, you know, breaking some 
computational problem, like the discrete logarithm problem that we assume is computationally infeasible to do. So you basically say, aha, this hypothetical attacker can't exist, and therefore we're okay. Um, and so we decided to kind of beef up the security model that was used for CLSEG compared to like LSEG and MLSEG. Um, and in doing so, um, ended up with, I would say like a pretty good model for how we want it to work. So that's pretty good. We're pretty sure that the, uh, the same security model would equally apply to MLSEG, um, but you know, we didn't go back and kind of retroactively do that. It was considered to be pretty straightforward. Do you know of anyone else that is actually using ML SAG in a sort of production like Monero is? Like, um, is there so, any other application that's widely used for this? Oh, you mean, you mean besides like projects that, you know, use, use it for the same purpose? You know, yeah, you know, I guess like, like, like code forks or, you know, um, you know, different digital assets that have at least like a, the same or a similar protocol, presumably use it. But um, I'm not aware of any other direct applications. Um, so originally LSEG, one of the, um, in the original paper that, that um, originally introduced LSEG, you know, one option that was listed was um, like voting schemes, for example, you know, where you want to be able to ensure that someone can't vote twice for a particular issue, um, but also have some ambiguity among the set of possible voters. I don't think that that's actually been implemented yet. I mean, secure voting is really hard for a lot of reasons, but it happens to be really good for the purposes that we use it for. Um, and so um, I guess got to finish up too, um, the Monero community commissioned an external audit of both the paper, I should be very careful and say preprint. Um, this uh, this preprint is still technically a preprint. So that means it hasn't undergone any other peer review aside from what I'm gonna talk about. Um, but we decided to have the preprint um, externally audited as well as the implementation for the upcoming October uh, network upgrade audited. Um, so that was done. Um, there were two um, auditors who were commissioned to do that. And that was in, uh, kind of in consultation with the Open Source Technology Improvement Fund, which is a nonprofit that does support for these kind of things um, and supported by Monero community donations. And the auditors had a lot of really good suggestions for how to improve um, the overall CLSEG uh, security model and preprint. So I um, ended up changing you know, a few of the proofs around and you know, generally just improving how the security model and proofs were structured and run. Um, and those didn't actually require any other changes to the, to the scheme itself. So the construction itself and therefore the code didn't change as a result of that, but we're now much more confident in um, the way that the security model was arranged, some of the definitions, the cryptographic hardness assumptions and things like that. So that's great. Those changes have been made and that's now um, up on the IAC RE print archive. And then the implementation um, surprisingly didn't require any real uh, changes for security, which you know, I feel like usually you get some in there. Uh, they did it. There were a few kind of informational ideas for how to simplify the code. Uh, but, you know, we considered that changing those, they would have been fairly extensive in how we handle certain key structures and such. And it was thought that it was probably more likely to introduce risk if we made kind of these big sweeping, you know, more informational changes um, than if we were to just leave it. So, yeah, so the report's available. Um, there's a blog post up on getmonero.org about it. You can read the full report, take a look at the preprint, look at the code, if that's your thing. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah, so, so that's scheduled to be deployed um, in the October network upgrade. So all you need to do is just keep your uh, software updated. You can use um, a hardware wallet like the Trezor or Ledger. Um, that's in process as well, getting their firmware and apps updated as well to make sure that that's good to go on a day and date when we're ready to go to. So if you use those, make sure you keep your firmware updated as well. Mm -hmm. And you'll be good to go. Very cool. We had a question come in from Andres. Um, he asked um, if there's any plans to in the future move past ring signatures to something that is not just hidden between other decoys, but um, you know have these additional protections beyond just a decoy level protection. So I guess you know there's quite a few things that I know are involved in this question. One is like we we have the current decoy selection, which per transaction has a relatively small number of decoys per selection, which provides reasonable. Uh, you know, mass surveillance protection, but less so good targeted surveillance if someone mm -hmm. knows information about particular transactions. So I guess given the current situation, what is the approximate timeline forward? Or not, not, not necessarily even timeline, but the, uh, the, the set of potential improvements forward for whether or not ring signatures are sort of the right approach for the future and <laughs> how you've approached dealing with, with the core problem of, of the relatively small per transaction uh, decoy levels. 
Yeah, yeah. So, so really, the question seems to be kind of about and anim- like per transaction anonymity sets. Um, I, I increasingly dislike um, the idea of using the term ring signature to purely mean a limited anonymity set, um, just because while it has been the case so far that our ring signature construction does have a limited anonymity set, um, I don't think it's like necessarily the the correct term to use. So it's possible to build transaction protocols with limited anonymity sets or full anonymity sets. And you could probably do all sorts of other things. Um, I mean, we know that there's transaction protocols that have no anonymity sets, um, <laughs> but those are typically not the ones we're interested in. Uh, so what we do right now is we do in fact use a linkable ring signature as kind of a building block in a limited anonymity set transaction protocol for the Monero protocol. Um, that's not the only way to do it though. So it is possible to build limited anonymity set transaction protocols that use, for example, specialized zero knowledge proving systems. Um, so I really don't like the whole idea of like zero knowledge meaning full anonymity and ring signature meaning not, because like that's not, that, that tends to be um, certain implementations now, but it is not generally true. Um, I mean, those things have, have much more technical meanings involving um, kind of proof and signature constructions, um, but using them the way that we do today. So, you know, it's, it's possible to, um, to kind of migrate over to a still limited anonymity set construction, um, but one that permits much larger anonymity sets for you know reasonable transaction sizes and times, but in a way that ideally would help against you know certain other forms of analysis or attack. Because um, again, right now the way that the transaction protocol uh, signatures scale is that they scale linearly with the size of the anonymity set. So you're really you're really kind of stuck there. Um, and there's been some proposals for ways to use uh, different kinds of specialized zero knowledge proving systems. Um, some examples of that are OmniRing is one of them, Volantis is another one, uh, Ring CT3, Triptych, Taurus. There's probably other ones that I'm just not thinking of right now. Um, but all of these essentially allow a transaction proof along with possibly some other auxiliary proofs that scales much better in terms of size and scales a little bit better in terms of time. Um, so verification time is unfortunately kind of the sticking point for this. So if you want a trust-free, like a non-centralized, you know, trusted setup style proving system and transaction protocol, you can make those proofs very small. Like we know how to do that already. Um, they're not as small, for example, as like the, uh, the proofs, not the transactions, but the proofs in say Zcash, but they're still quite small for the size of the limited anonymity set you can get. Uh, but verification time is always a sticking point. So with those particular kinds of protocols and proofs, you do need um, still like a almost linear verification time. And that'd be the sticking point. So <clears throat> that's kind of the limitation that, that exists. There are options. Um, they've all got some trade-offs in terms of, you know, what you can do with things like tracing and, and how the construction works. Um, some of them involve uh, changes to multi-signature operations. Um, there's changes to the way that linking tags work, which would kind of require almost sort of like a pool migration that could still be done safely. And so which one of these, if any, should be the one going forward is kind of up in the air right now. A lot of it depends on what trade-offs people are willing to accept and also what trade-offs people are willing to accept in terms of uh, mainly like transaction verification times. You know, obviously we'd like verification to be as low as possible because that means, you know, faster operations. Um, but that has to be balanced again, what kinds of analysis and attacks you want to be able to protect against. So ideally what we'd love to do is move to something that is in fact full anonymity set. Um, kind of the classic example that right now is something like, um, you know, the Zcash protocols where different anonymity sets um, that are involved there are basically enforced using proofs that, you know, do things involving Merkle tree proofs. Um, and what that effectively does is it effectively gives you, you know, a full anonymity set within that pool, absent external information. Um, that would be ideal, but right now, all the proposals that are kind of on the table for doing that um, suffer a lot in terms of either centralized trust or in terms of, say, proof size or time. Right now, you can't really have everything if you don't want to have centralized trust. Um, and of course, you know, there, there's also other issues with that. You know, for example, um, in many of the protocols, in many of the pro, hang on here, there's someone else joined the room here. Yeah, I think it's probably one of the next speakers, I, I assume. Um, but um, yeah. yeah, so anyway, right now, like that's kind of the limitation. So um, under the assumption that, you know, the project and its community are unlikely to move to something that would require centralized trust, um, you know, right now there has to be a limitation of limited anonymity sets. And so there's still questions about, you know, how do you end up choosing those anonymity sets? 
there are definitely ways that you can do it that I think uh, provide improvements over the way we do it now. As you get bigger anonymity sets, um, you can do um, kind of a, you can do certain kinds of binning with um, the outputs in those anonymity sets, um, and that can mitigate certain kinds of heuristics involving common ownership and you know the source of of you know, where those outputs came in terms of transactions earlier on the chain as well as timing analysis. So there's a lot of interesting stuff you can play with, but I don't think there's a really good understanding right now of what exactly those precise trade-offs people are willing to make are. Yeah, I, I, in my experience. Online, honestly. You know, we have, we have code that can do this now, um, but I think it's a matter of kind of the community and researchers and developers kind of getting into agreement on what those trade-offs should be. So, and again, hopefully, you know, eventually we get to something that is efficient and trust-free, which would kind of check all the boxes for everyone. And from there, you could, you know, very likely build a protocol that uses such a system and does, in fact, give you effectively, you know, full anonymity, which presumably would be enforced. In my experience, when people talk about full anonymity or limited anonymity, it's, it's sort of in an academic-only way, and then it's applied to, like, you know, it's... Typically, the way things are currently, right? So, limited anonymity looks like a Monero's case, right? And that, in many cases, people think that that just can't even really change. They don't really think about these. Limited is just, you know, anything less than the full pool, and that could be a, in, you know, a larger number than the entire size of the pool of a different network, theoretically. And then people are just like. Yeah, and it, and, it also, you know, it also, and it also depends on what exactly your threat model is, right? You know, are you concerned about, you know, a nefarious actor, you know, making a bunch of controlled purchases and then examining the possible transaction tree between you and like, an, you know, I don't know, an exchange with whom this person or entity is colluding. So, you know, given that, you know, it's, it's very difficult to get, I would say, like practical anonymity, you know, in that particular circumstance. And there's plenty of other circumstances that you can dream up where under certain threat models, limited anonymity just, you know, won't work for you. And so it's, it's one of those, like, it's one of those infuriating, it depends kind of things where, you know, it's, it's like limited anonymity right now is a trade-off. It is like an absolute trade-off. And we all look forward to the day when we can do something that's trust-free. And, you know, frankly, like if your particular threat model is going to require, you know, a more full anonymity scenario, you know, then, you know, you might have to consider whether or not going to like a trusted setup sort of scenario is something that you need to do. That may come with its other trade-offs, you know, based on you know, things like ecosystem availability and, you know, a host of other questions, um, but it's absolutely a trade-off, you know, and I think it's important to acknowledge that, you know, we have things like the Breaking Monero series where, you know, we kind of try to tease out some of the particular scenarios under which limited anonymity can be a problem um, and those for which it might not be as much of a problem, but, and it's, I feel like, no, it's, it's not fun to like sit down and try to enumerate and think about the specifics of a risk model, but you know, it's, it's something that unfortunately right now I'm kind of have to do. We haven't had a break in Monero series in a while. So I guess given that we haven't, what are, what uh, episode ideas do you, would you like to see there be episodes for? Oh man. Um, I think it'd be interesting to do one that talks about, um, I guess the more specifics on things like churn and self-send operations. Um, so uh, I would say things like that, something involving things like output merging would be very, very interesting, you know, where um, outputs from different transactions end up being pulled into different anonymity sets into the same later transaction. I'm um, looking at ways to possibly mitigate that, you know, larger anonymity sets with good output selection can mitigate that example. Um, the churn example is a bit tougher because you could look at things like, um, you know, possible, uh, possible chain history, sizes and distributions and look at, you know, what happens with that. I think it's, uh, yeah, there's a lot of interest, interesting things to talk about, um, but I think it's important to do them in a way that doesn't end up kind of just rapidly devolving into, you know, confusing graphs and, you know, irritating math. But at the very least, um, I think I'm really, I'm really happy at least to see that there is a lot of interesting research into this area. You know, a lot of folks want general zero knowledge proving systems that are trust free and efficient and you know that would i think would be like the ideal you know checking of all the boxes and it's interesting to see what different projects do right you know i mean things like uh, zcash and related projects get you know efficient proofs that are very fast to verify and you can do things like effectively full anonymity set 
transaction protocols, in theory, ideally, Zcash kind of has their whole um, optionality part to it, um, but are willing to sacrifice trust to a degree to like multi-party multi -party computation. You know, and there's there's always kind of the question of like, for your personal use case and how you tend to view multi-party computation, you know, do you think that a multi-party computation like set up kind of diffuses the trust out enough to where you're okay with that, or are you not okay with that? You know, because in the theory that it does provide like a guaranteed, you know, this is how the, the soundness of this operation could fail scenario if the multi-party computation were, you know, misused, for example. So, so many questions in this space <laughs> and so many trade-offs. I feel like a lot of cryptography is basically just like this, the precise study of mathematical trade-offs. But, you know, no, I don't really have a good timeline for when, you know, we might be able to move to something that is, you know, what you consider full anonymity. Um, but there are options for increasing the anonymity set, which lets you do a lot of other cool things, hopefully mitigate some analytical heuristics. So it wouldn't solve everything, but I think it'd be an improvement. So that's on the tip for October, right? <laughs> Kidding. Not for October. <laughs> so, I mean, there's other interesting things, you know, on the horizon too. Ideas for making range proofs a little bit more efficient have come up. Um, there was a preprint that came out on an improvement to bulletproofs called Bulletproofs Plus. The plus actually means fancy. The plus actually means taking away a few proof elements, but bulletproofs minus doesn't sound as good. <laughs> so I don't know. There was a proposal to, um, to do an implementation of that. It's really new. Um, it's it's kind of a it's an extension of the way that the bulletproofs inner product um, protocol works. And it's cool. There's this cool waiting operation with it, and it would let us you know take a few dozen bytes off of transactions. In theory, they'd be like very, very marginally faster to verify, but you know, in practice, it would pretty much be a wash. I think, in the grand scheme of things, um, so really the question about whether or not it is worth uh, moving to that is worth the uh, effort and the possible risk of something that's a bit newer has yet to be determined entirely. Were there any other uh, questions that came up besides the one that got us into a very long discussion about protocols? Yeah, there, there's there's one. It's it's still a protocol related question, so it, it is going to be a follow up though. It says so the ideal solution for Monero would be zk snarks like thing that doesn't tr require a trusted setup, and I, I believe you basically said yes, but also it needs to be efficient. <laughs> yeah, 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 and and you know, and and specifically saying like zk snark specifically, you know, it's there there are different ways to there are different building blocks you can use to construct protocols, and I think it's important to consider it at a protocol level. So, for example, like you could basically build something akin to, you know, like the Zcash sapling protocol, for example, um, but without using a ZK snort construction. You could do that with bulletproofs, for example. Um, I don't think it's actually been done, um, but I know that there were some estimates made to say, okay, you know, bulletproofs is a zero knowledge proofing system. Um, the scaling is, you know, in terms of verification, is not as good. <laughs> Just absolutely not. <laughs> Um, but, but what it lets you do is it lets you prove things about circuits in a trust-free way. So that is trust-free. And so in theory, you could take, you know, the circuit that's used in Zcash Sapling and some of the other constructions, and you could build that in bulletproofs, and you get rid of trust. And the size would still be pretty good. The estimates and the size are like, it'd be, it'd be competitive. Not as quite as good, but still pretty competitive. But the verification would be, no, it wouldn't work. Uh, estimates I saw are like still on the order of a second, which are like, well, a second, that's pretty fast. It's like, yeah, but then you got to do that like a million times. So, and you can like amortize that down with, with batching and stuff, but, you know, it, it seemed like it was not quite doable at this point. So I would say something that would let you do like the whole Merkle proof kind of thing that, you know, effectively lets you do a full anonymity set based protocol would be ideal if, you know, we could make it mandatory, which other projects have shown, you can do that um, to ensure optimal privacy. Um, but also I think ideally is making it trust-free or you know, at least diffusing the trust and the soundness out to the point where everyone is satisfied with it. Um, and I think it's been the general view of, of you know, a lot of folks who support the idea of Monero to just reduce that trust down to nothing. You know, whereas for other projects, they've decided that they're okay with the, you know, kind of delegating that soundness risk off to a large enough you know, set of participants in a multi-party computation that they are safe, you know, secure enough that they're, I guess, okay with the security of, is, I don't really know a great way to say that. 
Um, but that is risky. You know, I mean, like the Sprout multi-party computation that started Zcash, for example, did have a soundness problem. Um, and there was a kind of a whole deal where they had to end up taking down the proof transcripts and hoping that no one was able to figure out and abuse that. So like there's a, there's a real non-trivial risk involved even to something like such a multi-party computation. So that's not without risk either. And it, it makes the trust situation a little bit more tricky. So I guess I am personally of the opinion that, you know, I, I like the idea of, of, I guess, kind of minimizing the possible soundness problems. <laughs> you know, a soundness problem for something that involves like a trusted setup is the trusted setup and a multi-party computation. You know, for something that, for anything that uses, for example, Peterson commitments, which Monero does, other projects do too, Zcash does, you know, nimble nimble based assets do. You know, in theory, if you could break Peterson commitments, that's a problem with, you know, something akin to soundness as well. So it's, it's definitely kind of like this different, like, threat profile. And ideally, we want to minimize that. Got it. Um, something that was discussed, you know, quite a few years ago, but I don't think has really come up super recently is... The idea of second layer networks on Monero, like what if you wanted to put the Lightning Network on Monero? What if you wanted to put this, that, or the other on Monero? What if you wanted to put a, you know, a like ZK Snark mixer on Monero, like a, as an optional thing? Like, so I guess what what sort of building blocks need to happen to allow greater compatibility? Uh, knowing that n right after this, we also have a talk about atomic swaps for Monero too. Yeah, yeah, which is a which is a really cool new thing that's still that's still in progress, but. Um, yeah, so there's some other researchers who were looking at the possibility, what would it take to do, say, you know, atomic swaps between something like Monero and, you know, something like Bitcoin, for example, where in Bitcoin, there's a lot of stuff you can do because Bitcoin has both scripting capability, um, but also, you know, some different, some different kind of setups in, in, in how it's, you know, it's protocol works and in how it runs things like signatures and the like. And that gets really tricky because Monero does not have inherent scripting capability. Adding inherent scripting capability would be pretty awful for fungibility. So I tend to view that as probably a non-starter on the Monero side. So given that, the question is, well, okay, so what could you do for something like atomic swaps? And one idea um, that um, maybe talked about in the next talk, so I will try not to give too much away, involved um, a particular zero-knowledge proof that was kind of unspecified at the time in, in the write-up. In theory, we could have done it with something like bulletproofs, but it would have involved hash functions, and that kind of gets messy to do in, you know, in, in circuits. So that was not ideal. Um, but then, you know, they came up with another idea that uses this clever um, cross-group proof where you basically prove that across two different groups, which are, you know, otherwise basically algebraically incompatible, and you can show a quality of like an unknown discrete log. And it turns out if you can do this, you know, you can very cleverly kind of build it into this protocol involving some Monero transactions and some Bitcoin style transactions in a way um, that could let you do atomic swaps. It's pretty darn interesting. Um, you know, there's still, still some kind of open ongoing questions about um, you know, how you need to structure those transactions just to make sure that, you know, if, if one or more parties that are involved in this um, doesn't follow the protocol, you know, what are the risks to funds, if anything? You know, what's the worst case scenario that could occur? Um, and even then saying, well, okay, suppose that the protocol does work exactly as you expect and the swap does happen, you know, what information, if any, does that leak across, you know, uh, one or more of those chains? So, yeah, I mean, for example, if you use a centralized service to do swaps right now, like that can obviously have um, some risk because that entity knows presumably where assets came from and what you're sending them to. Um, so, you know, that kind of is a central storage kind of risk. Um, but also you can do different kinds of timing analysis and other amount analysis across different chains to try to determine, you know, what's going on and what funds are moving where. And if that's a risk for you, then you don't really want that. So I think the question of what, if anything, about that kind of analysis would transfer from the current setup, which is like, you know, use a centralized service to do my exchanges versus saying, well, I'll just do it atomically without a central service. Like what kind of analysis could still happen? It's not nothing because metadata always exists. But I think the question of to what extent does it happen and, you know, is that um, something that you want to do, I think are still open, but very interesting nonetheless. There were some other ideas for stuff like payment channel networks, even within Monero. Um, like DLSAG was another um, signature construction 
um, that some other researchers came up with. And we looked at it and unfortunately had like this tracing problem that would have required this whole self spend thing. And it, it was, it, it kind of got messy and there wasn't really a great solution for it, unfortunately. Um, so that kind of ended up being dead in the water for that purpose, at least, which was really unfortunate because DLSAG would have you know, opened the door to some interesting stuff. Got it, got it. I know this I'm is one of those LSAG names. Just yeah, eventually, we'll just go through every letter. letter. Something involving an LSAG construction, just for even more confusion. So okay. I know this isn't your work directly, but um, I know Isthmus recently opened a community crowdfunding system proposal to look into potential or potential limitations in Monero related to quantum computing. He was going <laughs> to look at the initial scope of what basically challenges Monero needed to address going forward. Can you speak a little bit about what, what, what this general work is doing and then also speak about Monero and quantum computing generally? Yeah, so this is, um, this is work that's ongoing. Um, they I believe we're gonna work on it for three months. And they're about done with the first month, I think, of that. Um, so again, I'm, I'm like not directly working on this, so I don't wanna try to speak for them or anything, but their idea was, okay, um, you know, under under the assumption that someday quantum computers would exist, and there's definitely debate on like to what extent people think that this would be a problem in the future. If so, how far into the future, you know, and if all of that, you know, what um, actions would we want to take now in the protocol to try to mitigate the possible future effects of you know quantum computers? And they want to look at kind of for different parts of the protocol, um, like range proofs and um, ring signatures and kind of a one-time addressing construction and all of this stuff. You know, to what extent would different parts of the chain be considered at risk? Um, you know, the way the Monero keys work, um, you know, there's a private key and a public key and they're related by, you know, this algebraic group operation. And it's pretty well understood that, you know, the one-way map right now from private key to public key, where we assume that it's computation and feasible to determine the signing key, just if you see a key on the chain, we assume that that's very difficult right now, and it's a one-way operation. Um, it's pretty well understood that, you know, given a sufficiently advanced quantum computer, that map would be reversible efficiently. So at that point, like, spend anyone's funds, which I don't know, that's a problem right now. But to some extent, like, it's not necessarily just a problem for uh, Monero. You know, this is kind of a broadly applicable problem. The entire internet runs on these one-way maps right now to a large extent. So it's kind of one of those, well, your house is on fire, but the rest of the world's on fire too. Doesn't make your fire any less bad, but it does mean that there's a, there would be a lot of problems to worry about. Um, but even beyond that, looking at things like, uh, what would that allow you to do to ring signatures? So as one example, if since um, the way that the key images or linking tags work um, within the Monero protocol, um, it would allow you to uh, look at different outputs that are part of a ring and determine which of them is the signer because of the way that the, the, the keys work right now. They involve private keys and you can basically do like a kind of a guess and check testing operation. So, um, you know, again, under the assumption of a hypothetical quantum computer, this is impossible today as far as we know, um, you could figure that out. Um, there's some other questions right now involving things like, you know, what could you determine about um, stealth or one-time addressing operations? Um, and that's still, I think, a little bit ambiguous right now. Um, one question that I have that I know is not unique to Monero is saying, well, okay, suppose that I will have a transaction here. Um, maybe I can't just use that transaction to, for example, figure out um, what the wallet address of the recipient was. Because um, remember in Monero, wallet addresses never appear directly on chain. They're used to derive these one-time addresses. So right now, I mean, without external information, you can't just use um, on-chain information to link those one-time addresses back to the wallet addresses. So the question might be, even with the quantum computer, um, could you take a transaction and determine its recipient wallet address just kind of with no external information? Or if you, for example, had a candidate list of possible recipients that you think it might be, because you know maybe you have a hunch or some other external information, are there ways that you could go and basically check those to determine which it would be? Um, and again, the address space in Monero is like the possible wallet address space in Monero is you know unfathomably huge. And you know, a quantum computer doesn't just mean like can do everything fast automatically. There's particular algorithms that we know that can be used against things like the discrete log problem and stuff. So, you know, even if 
you had a hypothetical quantum computer, you know, saying, well, couldn't it just go through, you know, all possible addresses and see which it is and figure out, you know, what, what recipient is linked to what transaction, um, you know, that, that's likely not going to be directly possible. But the question of, you know, what could such a computer do if it had like a small known list of possible addresses? So questions like that, I think, are still kind of up in the air and are part of the subject of the research that they're working on. Um, and I do know that they're also looking at kind of what current directions might protocol development take that could more efficiently, I guess, work on trying to like mitigate the effects of a future quantum computer. Um, I guess one problem with a lot of um, algorithms and constructions that are conjectured to be post-quantum secure is efficiency. They often tend to be much more inefficient than um, I guess would be reasonable to have on chain. You know, right now, if like post-quantum signatures, for example, can get pretty large. And there have been some ideas for how to do uh, some constructions like linkable ring signatures even, but they're very large. And even if you were to integrate them into the protocol, you know, we still deal with today's computers that, you know, still have to store things and do a lot of processing. And if it gets to be too large of a transaction that's too slow, no one's going to use it. So... You know, ideally, we'd like to migrate the protocol immediately to something that's conjectured to, conjectured to be post-quantum secure. But there's a lot of parts of the protocol that it's really uncertain if there's anything at this point that's efficient enough. Um, I mean, research in this area is always ongoing. So obviously, what's the state of the art today is almost certainly not going to be even close to what the state of the art is, you know, in 10 years, 20 years, you know, further down the line, where maybe we have a better understanding of the likelihood of seeing a practical quantum computer. So I think one thing that they're trying to do, and, you know, I don't, again, I don't want to speak for them, but just my understanding of the work that they're doing is to, you know, look at what are at least some directions in research that might give us an indication about what could be efficient down the road for protocol improvements. Um, I mean, I guess the general thing is, like, to some extent, like, in the, in the age of, you know, post-quantum computers, like, a lot of the Internet's kind of screwed in terms of security. Um, so, I mean, like, Monero would be... You know, at least to at least to some degree, not immune to this. The extent of which different parts of the, I guess, previous chain's history could be known. I think the exact nature of that is what they're trying to determine now. I mean, it's yeah. really interesting work. Whether or not you think that it's going to be applicable in you know your lifetime or the lifetime of people you care about, I think that's also very much kind of a contentious issue right now. I don't think that there's really universal agreement on you know when, if ever, folks might. Uh, end up seeing a practical quantum computer that would affect projects that they use. And I mean, I'm not even close to an expert enough in the area to be able to even hypothesize. Got it, got it. So switching gears, what research have you seen outside of what you've specifically done for Monero, I would say, that, that has been not necessarily useful, but just really interesting and really surprising? I would say, I think just like the extensive work that's been done on general zero knowledge proving systems, I think is really cool. Um, so, I mean, right now we use very specific zero knowledge proving systems um, in different projects for different purposes. I mean, Bulletproof, for example, is a zero knowledge proving system that does like one particular thing involving theaters and commitments really well. However, like that's just one application. There's, a, there's kind of a variant form of Bulletproof that you can use to take different algebraic statements, kind of mess them into this particular circuit format, and then build a proof over the circuit arrangement in order to prove that you know, I guess, like a witness that ends up satisfying the circuit without revealing what that witness is. And like, that's kind of the general form of like a general zero knowledge proving system. And so if you have like a protocol that you really want to implement, if you can put it into this form and do this kind of representation, then there's all these different tools that you can use right now to prove things about statements relating to the, this language that you built. So bulletproofs can do that. Um, the different proving systems that are used, you know, in stuff like the Zcash protocols can do that. There's a lot of stuff involving like ZK Starks. And, you know, there's a whole host of really interesting research on how to do this and what the different trade-offs are. And like I said before, like kind of the, I would say the holy grail for this is trust-free, small and efficient to generate and verify proofs. And ideally also stuff involving things like batching that lets you kind of amortize the cost of verification over multiple proof verifications. Like just the fact that there's so much fascinating work going on relating to this 
is really interesting. And unfortunately, none of it that I've seen, I think kind of uh, applies directly to the Monero protocol based on what folks want from it right now. You know, right now, the whole trust thing seems to be a pretty big sticking point. You know, and like I said, you know, for users who decide that, you know, they need a protocol that does more than what Monero can offer, like you probably at this point are going to have to sacrifice that whole, you know, where is, where is the trust lie question. But at the same time, the fact that the research is ongoing and is, has undergone so much improvement over a pretty short period of time, I think speaks really highly to where that area of research is going to go in the future. So, I mean, I think it would be great to be able to move to a general idealized future zero knowledge proving system you know, that lets us build really cool protocols that give us everything we want. Someday. It's not today. And hopefully it's not too far off. There has been a lot of work in that area. It's been oh, it's insane. shocking. Yeah, and, and to be clear, like I'm really glad that other projects are doing research in that and you know putting that kind of stuff in practice. Like as with all projects, including Monero, like I think it's important to talk about limitations and trade-offs, like which we've tried to do through things like this, through breaking Monero. Um, but it's still good that you know those different kinds of applications are also furthering more research. Sorry, I'm also helping some other later speakers come through. Okay, so you have another five minutes. There aren't any other questions that have come in, sadly. Just just the two from Andres. Um, so thank you, Andres, for answering those questions. We appreciate them. Um, no one else came to the office hours. They're true office hours. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's okay. No, I mean, it's good to kind of, I guess, recap, like, how, how stuff has gone and hypothesize as to where it might go. I mean, research is interesting. You know, you never know what's going to come up, what's going to work, what's not going to work. I think the upgrade in October is going to be exciting because, you know, Bulletproof was, I think, a cool example of something where transactions got smaller and faster and there were really no big trade-offs that folks had to consider. And I think CLSAG is another example where, you know, the transactions get a little smaller, they go faster, and not to the extent that Bulletproofs did, but, and there's not really any security trade-offs. You know, if anything, working to CLSAG helped to kind of improve the way that we understand linkable ring signature security models, you know? So if anything, like, I feel like there's more confidence now about the security of the setup that, that, that we're gonna have. So if anything, it's not really a trade-off, it's just, you know, a kind of an, an increasing stack of benefits. You're saying that it would be weird a little bit with whatever comes next, because with Ring CT, for example, it was an absolutely necessary change to get to hide the amounts of transactions and all the other benefits came with them. And I think the, the, the issues with denominated Monero were not, they still continue to not be well documented and I think like a, a very clear way. We, we know they're bad, but also I don't think we've had many research papers yet showing how bad they were. Well, um, I mean, the, the early Monero chain is, you know, a fantastic source of material for analysis. You know, I mean, it's, it's well understood that the effects of, you know, a, a lot of optionality in the protocol have, has always been problematic. You know, and a huge number of early transactions, you know, were effectively, I would say, de-anonymized in the sense of, um, like, ring-based signer ambiguity. You know, not, again, not based on um, walled addresses or anything. But, and I think that that's kind of still influences work that goes on today. Like, there's still parts of the, of the protocol that have some optionality in them. And, you know, it's, if you, you know, you can argue that it's good to have some flexibility in the protocol to allow for alternative use cases that you might not anticipate. But at the same time, like a lot of the work that especially um, folks like Isthmus and his group have done has shown that the optionality, you know, can lead to fingerprinting if you're not using standard software or using a service that does something in a strange way. And I think there, I think that a lot of folks are coming around to a better appreciation of the fact that limiting the protocol to you know, improve uniformity and decrease fingerprinting is is 
very much like a one-sided, increasingly lopsided argument toward, you know, limiting the protocol. And there's still, like, there's still things to do in terms of that. And I think the more that we understand about some of the early protocol decisions and how that optionality was bad, I think the more that that can influence better decisions going forward. You know, like the, the protocol will always have like the old chain to deal with. And I think the best to do, the best thing we can do is try to make good decisions going forward to, you know, improve uniformity that can decrease risk and improve safety. Understood. Andreas asked the last question here. Are there any projects working on voting based in Monero? I know like that one Italian government wrote up that one thing about how they maybe were considering. Um, yeah, that was, that was a political party, right? Yeah, it was. Yeah, I don't know if that ever actually got implemented. I, I mean, don't think it, it did either. Voting is, I mean, I'm by no means an expert on voting, but everything that I know, and I mean, folks who do different villages at DEF CON involving voting <laughs> probably know way more than I do that <laughs> electronic voting is tricky. And if you think you found out all the ways it could go wrong, like, it will always surprise you. So I don't know. I mean, I, I thought it was cool to see in the original LSAG paper an application to voting, just kind of as a like a fun academic thought experiment. And who knows? You know, it's presumably something involving, you know, good signer ambiguous proofs going forward. You know, might be beneficial. You know, who knows? Needed for voting, but you know, I, I don't think that like LSAG or CLSAG would be the thing to use. I mean, there's enough efficiency problems that you know trying to scale that out to the because again, like the whole idea was that you basically have like all the different possible voting entities is like part of a ring or the entirety of the ring. Like I don't, that isn't going to scale reasonably well. Um, and you know, the trust model is so much different for voting that you know you could probably get away with something that uh, ends up trading certain kinds of trust for yeah, I don't know. Maybe that, it's trading that kind of trust for better efficiency. It's I haven't thought about this nearly enough to be able to speak well to it. So I'll just keep rambling. Yep, understood. Okay, well, that's the time that we have. Thank you so much, Frank Nother. If people want to follow Monero Research Lab, there's always the Monero-Research-Lab channel. Sring's always there, of course, 24-7, manning this. Um, yeah, there's definitely the IRC channel. Um, if folks uh, don't want to be on IRC, you know, posting questions in R Monero, there's a lot of folks there who are good at research and development who can answer. Um, on the uh, Monero Project's uh, meta repo, um, on the issues there, um, you can see when all the meetings are and logs uh, from those meetings are always posted as well after the fact. So folks want to see like what people have been talking about. Um, yeah, and everyone's welcome into the meetings if they happen to have anything that they think is uh, you know, interesting or useful research the group might like to see. So Excellent. yeah, a lot, of, a lot of great contributors, not just me by any means. Um, a lot of really great researchers and folks who are interested in protocol improvements and you know improving privacy in the digital asset space. So thanks to all the other contributors. Well, thank you so much, Sring Nother, for joining us again. We 